this afternoon, our speaker will be Dr. Julia Lamont, and she will expound more on that subject. Dr. Lamont is, has a PhD and an MSPP, and she will explain what that is. She is um, in the Department of Pediatric Hematology and Oncology and Nephrology at the Indiana University School of Medicine, and also she's at the Raleigh Hospital for Children. Dr. Lamont is a pediatric psychiatrist who specializes in working with children, adolescents, and young adults with chronic medical conditions. In her role, she takes the principles of psychology, applies them to evidence-based pediatric health, and reduces access to barriers of quality mental health care. Academically, Dr. Lamott co-facilitates a cross-cultural cultural empathy through mindful reflective practice course designed to promote critical understanding of racism in medicine for pediatric residents. I present to you Dr. Lamont. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'm really um, honored to be here and to share this moment with you all um, as we talk about trust and mistrust within the sickle cell community. Um, if anybody has been to a, a conference and they've seen that a presenter has to have disclosures, I always thought that if you had a disclosure side like, and you had something to disclose, that that was a sign that you have made it. Um, and I will tell you, it doesn't really change anything. Um, we wrote this book uh, called A Kid's Book About Sickle Cell. We partnered with the company A Kid's Book About. If you are not familiar with that um, book series, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. I highly recommend it. Um, but we do receive um, some royalties from that book. Um, I do also want to recognize that there are aspects actually of my identity that shape the world in which I engage in and the way the world engages with me. Um, so I'm a pediatric psychologist. Um, at one point, I thought that our profession was built on ethics that centered the human experience, and yet my profession is responsible for perpetuating harm to marginalized communities in the ways that um, we have either limited access to mental health services for communities of color or pathologized behavior in communities of color. Um, so I recognize that I bring all of that with me when I stand before you. Um, the other piece of my identity is that I'm a white cisgender female. I'm also a mother. Um, there's probably lots of other disclosures I could make about <laughs> being white and what that has meant in our history. Um, but that, I think, I can't take that piece out of who I am. And that helps to shape everything I do. And I have to acknowledge that, including sharing this time and space with you all. As a pediatric psychologist, I live at the intersection of physical health and mental and emotional health, and how those two things intersect with each other to impact things like quality of life. Um, but a better representation of this intersection is actually uh, this picture. This is Kalina. Kalina is amazing. I get to work with Kalina I get to see her every few months to see and be part of the journey of her childhood into young adulthood, understanding both the ways in which the disease that she did not choose to have impacts her physical health and her emotional health and her academic health. This is also Kalina. I want you to remember the smile on this young lady's face. That smile is powerful. Kalina is an advocate. She is a Riley champion, which means that she goes all throughout the state of Indiana representing the hospital and sharing her story at just eight years old. She's incredible. But when she comes to the hospital, my colleagues on the inpatient side, those who are treating her when she is here for a crisis, do not get to see that smile. And so the context with which you know Kalina will shape the ways in which you perceive how she's doing.
and throughout our time together, I want to emphasize why context matters. So what happens when we take historical racism, systemic and systematic racism, a disease that predominantly affects communities of color, where there is significant disparities when it comes to how we allocate funds at a national level and at an individual level. That's the framework for the things that have led us to where we are when it comes to sickle cell disease. Um, but I'd actually like to build upon this, because it's, it's more than those three things. The hallmark symptom of sickle cell is pain. Pain is a subjective experience. Pain relies on you telling me how you feel, and then me believing you. Unlike an x-ray that can tell me whether or not your leg is broken, I don't have an objective measure for pain. The second component is race. Race is a socio-political construct. It's not real in terms of the ways in which it's been used to perpetuate misbelief around quote unquote biological differences. So considering the ways in which race and pain intersect, we can begin to fully imagine all of the ways in which the experience of living with sickle cell is the foundation, or the foundation has been built on um, a soil that is just wrought with opportunities for bias. So within the United States, um, sickle cell disease affects about 100,000 individuals. Um, we think that this number is actually like a significant underrepresentation, and that has to do with the fact that we do not have a national tracking system. However, we do know that it is the most common genetically inherited disorder that's identified on universal newborn screening. When we look at the prevalence of sickle cell disease, you see here that the areas that are in a brighter red tone, that's more prevalence. So sickle cell disease is a genetic mutation that we have understand the genetic mutation occurred, right? Genetic mutations happen because they're supposed to be protective. They're supposed to be helpful. So the genetic mutation was specific to malaria. So in areas where malaria was most common, having the genetic mutation was protective. So now you may be looking at this map and thinking the prevalence is occurring in areas where malaria is not a common problem. So I want to contrast this to the next slide. This is the map of the patterns of the displacement and the movement of enslaved individuals. So here in the United States, the presence of individuals with sickle cell can be tied back to this. What that means in the present day, so one, one way that we can compare things, because again, context matters, is when we think about cystic fibrosis. This is another genetically inherited condition. But with cystic fibrosis, that affects about 30,000 individuals compared to at a minimum of what we know for patients or individuals with sickle cell, that's about 100,000, so about a third. And yet, the number of research dollars that goes towards patients with CF 
is almost $11,000 compared to individuals with sickle cell, which is less than $1,000. As a result, that means that there are disparate outcomes in terms of funding for treatments. On that last slide, I mentioned that there were three treatments for people with sickle cell. There was an asterisk there because there used to be four until just two months ago. And I will talk about why that is a problem when it comes to trust. Here, you'll see the ways in which the, the, the blood cell, um, the, the typical blood cell occurs versus the sickle cell, which has to do with the deoxygenation of the hemoglobin, and that that sickled shape becomes stuck, which causes pain. And I mentioned before, the hallmark symptom is pain, so to understand pain, we have to actually understand how pain is treated or mistreated for communities of color. We know, because it's been well studied, that regardless of the level of care, whether we are assessing for pain, whether we're treating for pain, or whether we are managing for pain, we do a poor job at caring for black individuals. It does not matter the context. We do a poor job in the emergency room, we do a worse job in the outpatient setting, and it, it also doesn't matter what type of pain it is, whether it's acute, meaning you've, you've done something and now uh, you're in pain, or if it's chronic, or if it's related to cancer. So that tells us that there is a problem when it comes to how we treat pain that has something to do with race, but not biological, something else. When we look back at our medical textbooks, we can see that there are roots of racism apparent in the medical text, apparent in the articles that were published that perpetuated the idea that black individuals were somehow biologically different in the thickness of their skull, in their sensitivity, all with the purpose of justifying the inhumane treatment of enslaved individuals. Now, how this is still is present today is existent in the biases that we hold when it comes to pain tolerance and the misbelief that black skin is thicker we know that's not true, we know that's not true, and yet people still hold these beliefs. We also live in an opioid epidemic. Opioids are the number one treatment for pain. Oh, yeah, that's good. Um, so when we look at, um, we wanted to, or th this researcher wanted to understand how prevalent is opioid misuse in patients with sickle cell? Because the common perception of when a patient shows up in the emergency room is that they are drug-seeking. And yet the fact that pain is treated with opioids, when they show up asking for opioids, they're following the treatment plan but those who work in the emergency room perceive that they are there with suspect kind of, uh, interests. So they look to see, well, what was the most common reasons for death for patients with sickle cell? And the number one reason was um, things related to the circulatory system, second one being infection. If you go all the way down to the 19th, that was opioids. When we look at just the, the broad number of patients who died within that period, that, that represents only 2% of all patients with sickle cell. So if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck, not an opioid problem. So we're trying to understand how, what are all the layers at play when it comes to the treatment of patients with sickle cell? What are the behaviors that promote or facilitate trust? And what are the factors that perpetuate mistrust? 
across different layers. So at the very kind of far right, thinking about the larger sociopolitical climate in the middle in that gray area being the hospital and the, the medical systems. And then central to this is the interaction between the patient and the, the healthcare provider. Um, I work at Indiana University School of Medicine is the largest medical school in the country, which uh, led us to think, okay, we have an opportunity to impact how the providers, the future generation of medicine was gonna be receiving our patients. So what we ended up doing was we created a curriculum um, for our residents. And the way that it was uh, set up was, um, you can go to the next slide. Um, we created these four 90-minute sessions that were intentional. We need to talk about these conversations. I also live in Indiana where 95% of our residents are white. We used a framework that was um, based in evidence when it comes to how adults learn. But we, we did this at a time that was imperative for our hospital system. So we created this um, following the death of Dr. Susan Moore. Dr. Susan Moore was a physician who was treated in our own hospital system, who died as a result of complications from COVID. Dr. Susan Moore was a black woman. The university wanted to sweep it under the rug but you can't do that. You have to engage in conversation, so that's what we did. And we work with the residents every month to understand where the roots of mistrust come from. And what we found, if you go to the next slide, is that engaging in these conversations work. We saw a rise in all of the, or change in all the things that we had intended to when it comes to um, their, uh, personal growth, but then their understanding of these complex topics. Um, we also provided them with a uh, library of resources, so that's all 150 of our residents um, who are then able to continue to do the work outside of the month that we have with them. So as we go back to this diagram, I keep focusing on the under-treatment of pain. When I meet with a patient in the hospital, the um, two things that I think I hear the most when they, they have complaints is um, one, like the food is terrible, which is like a universal experience if you work in a hospital. Um, and the second is that you guys don't talk to each other. People come in the room and they ask me the same questions over and over and over again. The number one question being, how is your pain? How are you possibly supposed to get better if you are constantly reminded of the thing that you are trying to use all of those distraction coping skills to forget? I heard time and time again that the one to 10 scale is garbage. It's terrible. I don't know who created it, but I don't like it. It doesn't represent me. So instead, I said, okay, let's create something new. So I'll show with you a few examples of the things that we've been able to create. This is with pediatric patients. I love working with kids because they're so creative. Um, if we go to the next slide, you will see. Uh, this is what one of our, our young ladies created. She actually wanted to grade her pain instead of give a number. She wanted to be able to point to the words of her pain experience. Because being able to say that I'm, my pain is tingling, kind of like the small spikes on a hedgehog, or it's that long, drawn out pain, like the spikes on a porcupine. Or I can point on this picture where I am feeling the pain so I don't have to keep telling you on my body where it is. Because the experience of physical touch, if you make me touch my own body right now, I will scream. The next one, uh, this young person, both wanted to have some words with their pain. Um, they didn't want to look at the numbers. And I agreed. 
we don't need, we don't need you to say what number is because the numbers we know are garbage. So we're gonna put them on the back because we haven't fixed the system yet and we still need to document something in the chart which is a, a sister, like a, a battle for another day. But she wanted to be able to move where she was at. On this next one, this is a pain spiciness scale from Bell Pepper to Carolina Reaper. It was actually through this pain scale that I feel like we made the most movement with some of our nurses. For me, I, when it comes to how spicy food is, I think I'm gonna max out at like a jalapeno. I will never be able to uh, touch a Carolina Reaper in the same ways that I will never possibly be able to understand the 10 out of 10 pain that a patient with sickle cell experiences. And that way of empathizing was how we could shift the perspective for some of our healthcare providers. And then finally on this next one, I happen to really like this. Um, this was at the time that Ariel, uh, the new Ariel had come out. Um, and she wanted to be able to describe, because she knew that the pain comes in waves. She wanted to know if it was a small pain wave, a medium pain wave, or a large pain wave. She then wanted to be able to tell us if the pain was getting worse, so that ascension of the wave, if it was at its peak, or if it was getting better. Because how much more helpful is that than a number? That told us that the scale was broken but there's many things that are broken. And some of the things that are broken happen at the system level and the funding, like I mentioned earlier. And advocacy and using our voices to get folks to care and to fund what we're doing is important. And you can't do it alone. So here, on this next slide, you will see our team. Actually, our team has grown, which blows my mind because I, 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 like, it's just incredible. It's, it, these, these folks are incredible. When everyone has this, the same shared mission, this is us from, uh, gosh, almost three years ago, at our state capitol for um, our Sickle Cell Advocacy Day, where we get to meet with senators and representatives and get them to make sure that they fund the programmatic efforts within our state of Indiana. And as a result, we were able to double the funding in just one year. So you cannot do this work alone. This work requires a community. Within our own patient population, we wanted to then understand, so we kind of talked about the individual, then at the, the system level, both within our hospital and within our state, we get to see our patients every few months. But they go back to communities that look very dis different and the ways in which resources are allocated in their communities was quite disparate. And we wanted to understand that because we only see you for an hour or two every few months. Your life is so much more than that. So we wanted to look at some of the community-based factors. So we, oh wow, you really cannot see that. So I will give you the overview. Um, we wanted to understand what the barriers were in accessing care. So we asked caregivers, what makes it hard to come to the visit? For about 20% of our, our families, they have to drive more than an hour just to get to us. Um, we live in Indiana where you really have to drive everywhere. Um, I'm sure that may be not as, as uh, meaningful when it comes to public transit and all of the trains and buses you have to take to get places. But for our families, because we are the, uh, the largest sickle cell center, and because of the ways in which Medicaid restricts where you can and cannot receive care, we have folks who come from Gary, Indiana, which is basically Illinois, just to have access to care. And families, the number one thing that they said was that having to come here affects my ability to work. A day off work is make or break within our families. So we then wanted to take this a step further. 
So we use the Childhood Opportunity Index. This is um, data that is collected through the census that looks at what access to resources you have in your community. Um, it's not zip code data, it's actually address-based data, which is important because when you think about a zip code that covers a large amount of uh, land or a, lot, a large amount of space, and you can, even within one zip code, have a lot of different um, variability when it comes to what resources you have. So this looks at things like education, whether or not teachers in the school that your child is districted to are in their first year following graduation. If I've learned anything from Abbott Elementary is that you really want your child's teacher to be experienced. Actually, that's not the only thing I've learned a lot. It shows great. Um, when we looked at the COI data, this is the Childhood Opportunity Index, where low opportunity, that's the light blue areas, were related to the frequency of missed appointments. We also assess for psychosocial risk factors, and so having more psychosocial risk factors was not only associated with living in a low opportunity area, but also to missed appointments. These things were also related to the frequency with which their child was accessing acute care, meaning they could not come to us for the preventative care or their standard of care and that they were only using emergency room services. So that said to us, we have to understand the communities and we have to partner with the communities that our, our patients live in because even if 80% of our, our kids live within an hour of Indianapolis, if you look at that map, there's like a, oh, sorry, just go back for a second. There's like this like little crescent of dark blue that um, hovers around Indianapolis. I don't know why I'm telling you this uh, because you probably don't know where Indianapolis is in the map. It's in the center. I, fun fact, um, had never been to Indianapolis or Indiana for that matter before I moved there, so I've learned a lot about the geography. But there's a little crescent above Indianapolis in the center. Um, and those are the wealthiest communities. Those are where the majority of the physicians and lawyers um, live, and that is not where our patients and families live when it comes to the hour or less than an hour commute that they're coming from. So what do we do about this? Part of it is education. Part of it is when you hear somebody say, oh, well, that's a patient with sickle cell that the, their drug seeking. That's the, the, the phrase that I hear the most that gets me the most angry because of the bias that comes in that. And so the way I respond is, great. They are coming here for the treatment that they need. That is exactly what their pain plan says. It says they come here and that they need to get pain medication within 30 minutes. That's what our algorithm says. To reframe that, to be informed by education and standards and not bias and misbelief. We then have a responsibility to advocate. And that can be advocating within the levels of the systems you engage in or at the bedside or um, advocacy looks like speaking up in a one-on-one -on -one conversation to correct something. Advocacy, I think we often have the misperception that it's I have to make a, a change at a legal level or I have to make a change at a governmental level, but no. It's the collective of those small actions that lead to powerful change. We also have to own, we have to own where we're at now, which means exploring those internal processes or the things that come to mind, and we have to engage in conversation. But the most important thing in the action steps is actually at the center. We have to listen. You'd think that that's like, well, yes, duh. People do a lot of talk, but they don't always do the best listening because we have a responsibility to hear the voices of the folks whose voices have been silenced or whose voices we have written off or whose voices 
we discredit. We have to listen, which then changes what we do next. And sometimes that means literally getting on the floor to listen. So on that note, I'm gonna turn it back over to Joanne. How's everybody doing today? Good, good. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is um, I'm gonna just put up a very quick slide, uh, one slide on sickle cell, so that very first one, just to get everyone on the same page and then I'm gonna call up the panelists. So, um, just so that everyone knows what it is and what we've been talking about, it's sickle cell disease. Sickle cell disease is something that's inherited, meaning, um, and uh, Dr. Lamont had mentioned newborn screening. It is picked up on newborn screening and it is inherited. So both parents are carriers and they have a child who's affected. Um, there's a change in a chromosome that causes this, uh, this problem with the hemoglobin. And then there's a picture there of the hemoglobin um, normal is that nice circle, and sickle cells are the ones where it looks a little bit like a half moon. The main features that we see in terms of the phenotype or the symptoms are up there, and the biggest thing to keep in mind is pain, and where does the pain come from? If you look at that vessel, the pain comes from the misshaped cells that are in that vessel. So that's just to get everyone sort of on the same page of what sickle cell is, what it is to think about. Pain is the biggest feature that we all wanna think about as we're bringing up our panelists. Um, and we're going to have them sort of tell their stories. Um, I'm gonna have the panelists come up and they're going to introduce themselves. I don't remember what order you guys were in when they, when they told you, hopefully you know, but I will have all the panelists come up right now and take a seat up here. And again, I am Joanne Adelberg. If you were in earlier sessions, you may have heard me. Um, I'm a genetic counselor and a family advocate here in Howard University at the Department of Pediatrics. Um, we're here today to unravel medical mistrust in sickle cell disease. Um, and that was a wonderful overview, Dr. Lamont. Um, and now it's time to hear from uh, the people on the panel. I'll have everybody introduce themselves. So well, I know that you just, yeah. We're gonna skip me, you, you yeah. <laughs> oh, good afternoon. My name's Charles Carrington. I'm a sickle cell warrior, uh, 42 years old, um, from Hartford County, Maryland. Yeah. Hi, my name is Charles Vicky. I'm also a sickle cell warrior. Um, I'm from everywhere. I was born in Miami, but I grew up in Arizona. Um, went to school in Atlanta, and now I am in the DMV area. Um, I'm four, 35, 35, and I had my first child earlier this year. Congratulations. Hi, I'm Larissa Stewart. I'm a third year medical student at Howard University College of Medicine. I won't tell you how old I am, but just trust me, I'm older than a lot of my colleagues. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Sohail Rana, and I saw my first patient with sickle cell disease 38 years ago, no, 48 years ago. <laughs> How could I mess up that? <laughs> I, I wanted to look younger. Huh? So I was in Brooklyn, um, and I've been taking care of children with sickle cell disease for, let's say, both primary and secondary and tertiary, all three of them, for the last at least 40 years my life, professional life. So it's, it's, it's been a long journey, and I've learned a lot from patients with sickle cell disease. 
Some of my patients are now grandmothers, and I take care of their grandchildren and children, and sometimes they walk over for a prescription too. <laughs> so, so my oldest patient is probably 48 or so. <laughs> oh, thank you. So, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to get started with some panelists' questions. Um, we're going to have the questions grouped. We're going to do the warrior questions first, and then um, provider and warrior questions, and then kind of summarize at the end with the provider. And then um, our medical student is going to come up and sort of give us an idea of everything that she's learned. And then Dr. Rana will um, close us up with a, uh, with a summary at the end. Okay, so you guys ready for questions? Okay, so if you could, yeah, you have the warrior questions that are up there. Um, I'm gonna say them, I know that you can't really see because the, the screen is, is on the side. So I will say it and then I will call on you like whoever's ready to answer, okay? So the first question is, what do you wish your healthcare providers knew about living with sickle cell disease? So um, we'll start with Charles. Do you want me to repeat the question? Yes. Okay. What do you wish your healthcare providers knew about living with sickle cell disease? I guess one of the main things that I would want my providers to know. Well, there's a few, but that this is a partnership, this is a collaboration, this is a, let's just say, this is teamwork, and it's like, I'm 1A, you're 1B, and we're in this together, and nobody's gonna know my body better than me. Um, there's a sense that you have a, as we saw, with the blind people and the elephant, that, that tale, that there's different perspectives and when you come together, you can get a full picture. And so that's the main, that's the first thing. Secondly, I won't want my providers to know that when it comes to sickle cell anemia, that it's more than just the physical pain, it's the emotional, it's the mm -hmm. mental, it's the spiritual, it's the social aspect. And the physical, that's understandable, but the mental, that takes a toll on you as well. Um, I find myself asking questions you know, I find myself asking myself questions like the pain that I'm dealing with, would it be better to have a, I guess, a shorter life with less pain mm. or a longer life, you know, with more pain? And if I had the choice and my choice is right now, I would want a shorter life with less pain or no pain at all. And that's like the mental, um, emotional is sometimes, it's a lot <laughs> when you're dealing with what you're dealing with. Um, and especially as a man, you're expected to, to be strong, to always be strong and to not show any weakness. And, Cause if you do, it's almost like you're I don't know, less of a man or whatever the case may be. So sometimes it's just a lot. And I'm sorry, could you could you speak up? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh. I didn't hear 90%. Oh, okay, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. No. Um, speak slowly and loudly. Okay, I got you. And and he is the target audience that you want to talk to. I got you, I got you. <laughs> so I was saying more about the emotional and dealing with the mental. So as far as like mentally, I ask myself questions as far as like, um, you know, what I may be going through as far as, oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought, I apologize. But mentally, it's just, it takes a toll. Emotionally, it can also take a toll on me. And 
also the, you know, the spiritual and the social aspect as far as the fear of being believed and people's biases and so forth. So, I, yes, sir. I, I feel yes, sir. So, um, Sherelle, do you have, do you want to answer that question? Um, sure. As loud as you can. Wow, it's totally fine. Um, I can read it again. You want me to? I can read. I, I okay. saw it. I can see it. Okay. So the one thing that I would like my healthcare providers to know is that we're not the same. Sickle cell has different effects on every warrior, and I need to be treated like the human being that I am because I'm going to come in treating you like the human being that you are. Um, I also think that it's very important that tone matters. <laughs> uh, a lot mm -hmm. of times I do feel... Sometimes providers do have this, I need to tell you in a certain tone. Um, and to me, I can find that to be very alarming. And so I, I have no problem with saying like, the tone sounds like you're directing me to do something instead of advising me. Um, so I just need you to know that I'm a human being just like you. <laughs> So um, the next question, Charles, can you remember a story of a great interaction with a healthcare provider? And tell us what made it so great. Uh, so here recently, um, with one of my providers. Uh, uh, keep talking. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so with one of my providers, um, I kind of this, we had a conversation he sat down and talked with me. He listened to me. He fully understand what I was, what I needed. Because at that point, um, there was a concern for my usage of my pain medicine. So we had to have a serious conversation. And before I had felt like people were as, was discussed earlier, treat me as I'm a drug seeker because I do ask for pain medicine, right? But that's the only option I have been given. So it's like, if I'm asking for something and you're telling me you don't want me to have such and such, then I need a, another, another option. And that wasn't presented to me. So he actually presented me with another option. And I've been on this option for like the last week, and it's World Wonders. And you feel and, yes. And I, I think more than likely you also feel better because you were hurt. Uh -huh. At least 50% of it. You uh -huh. know, the healing occurs when uh -huh. people feel that they've been hurt. Yes, yes. exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and he, they've been believed. Yes. Yeah. And, and he heard me. Yeah. He heard me. He believed me. And, and we took the next step. You said something very beautiful. Uh -huh. And, and, you know, I've been, I've said it before that a lot of fear of patients coming to the clinic is that anticipation of not being believed. Oh. Mm. So they almost prepare themselves for that. Right. And some of the misconception within healthcare professionals, you know, you, it's like you don't look like you're in pain, you know. Uh, so patients say, should I be moaning and groaning? So there are people mm -hmm. I've seen who were talking on the phone and they start moaning and groaning, not because they're doing drama, but they feel that they won't be believed. They're afraid of saying, oh, you know, my pain is a little better or 30% better because they're afraid the pain medication will be cut down and they don't want that to happen because they are just beginning to stabilize. Uh, is that close to your feelings? Yes. Very much. Yeah. Right. And I, I, I think what you said is very beautiful. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just repeating it yeah. so that everybody hears it, that, that I think in healthcare, it's not just sickle cell disease, one thing you have to remember. That we had a flyer for the conference which said that 70% of patients feel that they haven't been hurt. Mm -hmm. Their physicians are not compassionate enough. They, are, they don't have any time. And partly because there isn't enough training. You know, you, you listen to medical students when they're entering medical school class, and most of them left. There were 30, 40 of them who were here early in the morning. They, most of them have left because they, 
have exams and this and that, interviews and what. But Larissa knows that when I had people in the clinic, medical school, I tried to fuss about those things. Because we are all, you know, they we come in with medical school full of compassion, you know. And we are doctors, we, we describe ourselves as the most compassionate people, you know. I do everything. But we don't know how to communicate that. I mean, there are specific skills, you know, of showing that I care. And, and one of the things I just did demonstrated was I sat down, you know, and I, I lowered myself, you see, intentionally because I want to empower you that I'm listening, but also I'm no bigger than you because there is a power gradient between me and you because I'm a physician and I'll be writing a prescription and you have to do whatever to please me. To, to, you see what I'm saying? So there's a power gradient and physicians have to learn to de-empower ourselves in order to, you know, feel that patient is really yeah. feeling the compassion. So, so uh, I, I'd let, like let, to let give Sherelle a, a, a chance to it. respond. Mm -hmm. so. I, I, I think there is. Okay. I totally, um, I do believe that it is important for people to hear single cell warriors and their stories, but mm -hmm. I also understand in collaboration, it takes two. Um, it's a two-way street. But I also think the issue that a lot of us aren't really addressing is that Insurance plays a huge part as to how we treat mm -hmm. a sickle cell patient. And for me, um, I have private insurance, so I have the luxury to build my, my medical team, and that's not the advantage for most sickle cell patients. Mm -hmm. So that is something that should be focused on, too. Um, for me, personally, I realize that in my advocacy, I have a voice, but I'm speaking for a minority in my group. Right, majority of my my page, or majority of the warriors, Absolutely. they you, have. You said it very beautifully. Perfect. Yeah. So, in the midst of us talking mm -hmm. about the greatness, I don't want to miss the point that even though I can speak about my experience, I'm still the minority in the majority of this group. Most of the people, most sickle cell patients, they're limited in their resources. So, if we're also going to talk about treatments, we need to also talk about those treatments within the systems that they're in as well. Um, that's all I would Do you want to tell us like a positive and a negative story that you've had with a provider? Well, I, yeah, sure. I can definitely say that um, here at Howard University Hospital, I've had some really great, powerful conversations with Dr. Taylor, who's the head of the sickle cell clinic. Um, Nurse Diaz, she is phenomenal and amazing. Um, but we actually had a conversation regarding on like just how things are thrown at at people mm -hmm. and how there's a comprehension level uh, understanding. And Dr. Taylor is a great, 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 smart man. But he throws really uh, heavy words at you sometimes that you don't know how to understand that. So stopping him, because he's OK with being stopped, asking him those questions like, hey, what does this actually mean? He'll break it down to you. But he told me a story about as, you know, it's a lot of, it's harder to, when you're restricted, dealing with people with um, Medicare, Medicaid, and things. And at times, it can even be dangerous. He's had a gun pulled out on him. And to me, Ooh. that speaks volumes as to it's a two-way street in speaking and having empathy and always understanding that this individual is trying to do the best that they can, but they're also limited based off of the system you're placed. So that's a great thing. No, it's very well said. I, I think what you said, close to 70, 80 percent of people living with sickle cell disease, I would say that for people living with HIV too, uh, and, and many other chronic illnesses, they have federal insurance of some sort. Uh, that could be Medicare, Medicaid. So they are restricted by the policies of that insurance company. I mean, one of the most ridiculous things, yesterday a mother was complaining that my child cannot handle her pain anymore. She's 10 years of age, 9 years of age. And could you write something stronger than just ibuprofen? So I debated and I wrote a prescription for Tylenol with codeine. And she went down to the pharmacy and they said, oh, there's no way insurance is going to okay this. So we, we did totally. And oxycodone was out. She's too little for oxycodone. 
And it makes absolutely no sense because mm -hmm. a child one day of age or nine years of age or 25 years of age or 60 years, white, black, you know, they feel pain the same. So whether it is economic, whether it is the policy, whether it is affordability, you know, you're restricting access to care and because we cannot judge patients. Okay. You, you, you cannot judge. I can't know your pain and mm -hmm. you can't know my pain. I could be smiling and I could, mm -hmm. when I write down, I have nine out of 10 pain. And you are telling absolute truth. You see what I'm saying? And I think this is where also the compassion for each other, you know, when, when we are advocating for each other, it is so critical because there are people with sickle cell disease who actually have very little pain. I have patients who've been taking hydroxyurea since they were babies. Some of them have never had a pain crisis. And, and you know, and when it happened most of the time because they forgot to take or they got angry and didn't want to take or mom was fussing and now they don't want to take. So, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. So, so anyway, yeah. so, and then they come down and then they go back. And there are other people who have had nothing but pain crisis starting very early. And their bones are like 80 trucks ran over their bones. Yeah. And they ain't healing. You know, there's no way you can make those, you can bone marrow transplant them or do whatever. You cannot make those yeah. bones heal. They're broken. So I, I, I think one sickle cell patient says, oh, I take this nutritional supplement and I do this and I do this, you know, you can't yeah. pass that judgment on to the next person too. Yeah, so, so there's not a unifying voice many a time <laughs> within a community also. Even, I mean, I tell you an example of HIV. You know, people who are heterosexual and they got HIV, they think their stigma is much worse than, oh, those LGBT, you know, in their mind, they should suffer. Do, 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 do you see what I'm saying? And I see it so, I hear it so openly. And I go like this, you know, and it's so we, we all have these stigmatized communities and then within community we have more stigma with certain, we need to be empathetic to each other, I think. I think that's very good. So, so Dr. Rana, this is, you're giving like such great details, thank you. Like, I, you know, but one of the things, and you were talking about it as well as Dr. Lamott, was they were talking about their pain and emergency rooms. And, you know, where it, they really intersect, I think, with a lot of what we're dealing with, with medical mistrust, is really with the emergency rooms and how our doctors are trained. So one of the questions I'd really love to, to hear a little bit more about is when these warriors enter the emergency room and the kind of experience that they have there so we can all hear about it. And, what is their experience in the emergency room for our audience and those that are online so we can further like educate our, our students and our, our, you know, our audience here on what it's like being in the emergency room as someone with sickle cell. Like what is, what is that experience for you? And if you could, I guess, why don't we start with Sherelle this time because I've been starting with Charles. And why don't you give us an experience that you've had in the emergency room Say it again. Are we going to be able to talk about the story, or do you want us to just answer the question? No, no. Go, why don't you, Why don't you go ahead and, okay. and just real quick? Oh, okay. You want to talk up here? Yeah. Oh no, I don't. Actually, I could just sit here. Okay. Uh oh. Yeah. Okay. No. No. You. You. you you're welcome to speak okay. up here if it's a little bit easier. For you. Okay. She has a question. Oh, she has a question. Okay, um, imagine this. You're sitting in a packed emergency room, gripped by a pain so intense it feels like your bones are shattering from the inside out. Your breath is shallow, your oxygen levels are low, and your blood is clotting in too many places. The room is chaotic, but you're told to wait, and wait, and wait. All the while, you're silently asking yourself, do they even understand how bad this hurts? This is sickle cell pain. This is the mistrust rooted in years of dismissal, stigma, and bias. 
This is the pain of being seen as an invisible. Sitting there gripping the side of the chair um, to keep yourself from breaking down, you wonder if you think you are drug, if, if you are here for drug seeking. Um, you've learned to suppress your emotions, to remain stoic, crying, pleading, or showing too much emotions, um, risk being labeled historical, combative, or uncooperative. Labels strip you from your dignity. I know this reality because I live it. I'm a part of the invisible group of individuals with sickle cell disease that have learned to conceal their intense pain just to be heard. From childhood, I've been conditioned by stigma, by uh, pain suppression becomes second nature because expressing it openly risks mistreatment or none at all. Silence becomes survival, but silence doesn't mean I'm fine, it means my voice has been taken. For me, mistrust felt like an armor, but in reality, it was a scar, a lesson taught by negligence and abandonment. Yet over the years, I've been fortunate to find a team of medical specialists here in the DMV area that understands my condition and provides care with compassion. I know this statement isn't shared by everyone in the sickle cell community. Many are still trapped in cycles of mistrust, fighting for equitable care. I'll never forget visiting a, my boyfriend in Maryland and experiencing a sickle cell, sickle cell crisis. After self-medicating without relief, he drove me to the nearest hospital. Struggling with pain, I told the clerk my condition, provided my insurance detail, and was told to sit and wait. As the waiting room empty, my pain worsened. After what felt like forever, I asked about the, de the delay. I was labeled as a non-emergent emergent patient. Fighting back tears, I begged to be reassessed. Another hour passed before I was taken. In the exam room, a nurse started my IV but avoided eye contact. Uh, eye contact. Another nurse took tasks with pain management, offered me Tylenol 3. When I requested for something stronger, she dismissed, saying, this is a dry emergency room. No doctor will risk their license for you and your pain. I felt powerless. Hours passed in agony before I was finally admitted. What made this especially disheartening was the lack of understanding and empathy. I assumed that being in an area where there are more warriors, the staff would be more familiar with sickle cell. I was wrong. The mistrust doesn't just stop in the, just stay in a hospital. It ripples across every aspect in life. It touches the four quadrants of existence, professional, personal, emotional, and social. Chronic pain can often limit career opportunities. I've missed work due to untreated pain, but how do you explain that to your employer? What do you say? I couldn't come in because my doctor didn't believe I was sick enough to get treated for pain. Over the time, the mistrust erodes into job security and forces many warriors out of the workforce altogether. Mistrust follows us home, too. Family members don't always understand why we distrust doctors. Friends may think we're exaggerating when we talk about the challenges of getting care. The emotional toll is not being believed as anxiety and depression and a fear of dismissal that's heavier, that's heavy as the physical pain itself. So how do we fix this? It starts with empathy. For healthcare providers, stop judging pain how it looks. Start asking questions like, what does pain feel like for you? Or how does this compare to your usual pain? Listen. For allies, amplify our voice. Stand up, stand with us in advocacy. Challenge stereotypes that reduce us to labels like you don't look like you're in pain or you're a drug seeker. For all of us, understand that pain doesn't always come with tears. Sometimes it's carried in silence and is the greatest act of strength. Medical mistrust is just, isn't just my burden. It's a reflection of a broken system, but trust can be rebuilt. It begins with empathy and a simple act of listening. Let's create a world where warriors like me um, don't have to sit in silence a world where our voices are heard, our pain is believed, our care is delivered with dignity because no one should have to carry the extra weight of mistrust. So, it's always not amazing but how you can meet somebody and you hear your story and their stories. And it's just like, I don't know, but I have a very similar story as far as my ER experience. Um, back in 2004, I was about to head into my senior, well, my fourth year here at Howard University. Um, almost two weeks before move-in date. And I had just got off work. I was living with my cousins in PG County. I tell my cousin, I'm like, I need you to take me to the hospital right now. And 
I'm from Baltimore area. And my cousin called my parents. They said, bring him to Johns Hopkins. That's where I always gone for my care. That's where they took me to. And when we get to the hospital, to the ER, I, at this point, um, I'm almost like out of, body, out of body experience. The pain had reached new heights for me. And if you know me, I'm not the one that's going to complain. I'm the patient patient. Um, and so when I started crying, like literally crying out for help, this is when my parents get concerned and they go in, mom goes into mom mode, like get my baby help now. And yet her cries, my cries, they all fell on deaf ears. And eventually they moved me into like, I wasn't in a room, but I was put on a stretcher in the middle of the hallway. And I just remember laying there watching people pass me by as I'm literally begging for help. And it gets to the point where it kind of goes blank for me, like I don't remember. I remember staring at the ceiling, at the light, thinking that this is the, the light at the end of the tunnel, like this is it for me. And I don't remember much after that, but I know that crisis ended up with me being in the hospital for three and a half months. Um, I was had avascular necrosis. I mean, sorry. No, I did have avascular necrosis, but my lungs had collapsed. I was put on a ventilator. Um, I was put on life support. During that time, doctors told my parents to say their final goodbyes to me. And it makes me wonder what could have happened if I would just seen, received care sooner and not put it off as if my pain wasn't what it was and they didn't have to get to that level. And it just makes me question, like, what do you see when you look at me? Like, even with the tears, even with the crying out, it still fell on deaf ears. So that's, that's my, my ER story, or one of them. So, yeah, thank you. That was just so moving to, to hear that story. Um, you know, I know that I had like slides prepared, but I almost like don't want to run out of time. And I know that there was someone in the audience who really wanted to come up and tell her story. So like, if you're comfortable coming up, I think that we'd all love to hear your story. And then, um, you know, and, and then we can move on. But I'd, I'd really like to have some participation and, and some people come up. I don't know if there are any other warriors in the audience. Um, but I know that someone wanted to come up, so. Hello, how are you guys? Um, so I'm Brianna. Um, and it is crazy to see how we all have like, like, it's like the same story over and over and over again. And you would think that people hearing this would actually make them care more and actually make them have like, like believe in what you're saying, but I don't know. Um, in my situation, I also have a vascular necrosis, which is actually really terrible. And I feel like it's such a huge complication of sickle cell that it's not even talked about enough. And with so many, like with so many people having sickle cell and having this complication, like I would think that I'd get some sort of like support or some sort of help, but it's very much like, oh, well, we can't help you. Just deal with it, you know? And I also feel like in terms of going to the ER with sickle cell, horrendous to the point where like 
unless I feel like I'm, I'm, on my, I'm on my deathbed, I'm not going to the hospital. Because when you go there, like, they literally treat you like dust on your feet. Like, it's actually crazy. Because I'll go, I'm in tears, I'm in pain, I'm crying, I'm like, help me, like, please. But then they're like, well, you know, we don't really know what, what's gonna work for you. And the thing is, I'm very thorough, so I have a list of all my medications, what works, what doesn't work, and I'll tell them, I'll, I'll show you the list, I'll, I'll write you the list. But then it's like, well, you know, we have to try it our way, try our style, try our drugs. And I'm like, it's not helping me. And you lay there for hours on end, just like in pain and no one caring. And I'm really sorry that you have to go to the point where it's like life support. I got to that stage too, absolutely terrible, to the point where I'm like, I can't breathe, my heart is failing, no one cares enough to actually, you know, help you. And I just feel like this is like a war cry for sickle cell patients. Like, we need support, we need help, we need someone to step up and actually believe me when I tell you I'm in pain. Like, yes, I'm standing here looking all dressed up, yes, I'm smiling 24-7, but dog, like, I'm hurting on the inside. Like, believe me when I tell you I'm, I'm in pain, you know, but yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Haven't heard from you yeah. So um, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, and I think we all want to keep in mind sort of what the purpose of this is. And it really is a, a learning event for all of us. Um, to hear your stories and take these pieces and bring them in so that we can be better practitioners and we can be a good provider, a, you know, an empathetic provider. So having said that, um, we have a medical student on our panel and she has created beautiful slides and I would like her to kind of help, you know, bring this all home and bring in a summary of, you know, what today is and, and sort of like what the points are that we want to hit. So if you could basically skip the rest of my slides and get to Larissa's slide, because I know we have a three o'clock, um, the session ends at three. So why don't you come on up? Good afternoon. So it's a privilege for me to be here today with all of you. Um, to discuss a topic that resonates with me so deeply, and this is stigma in healthcare and the importance of breaking down these barriers so that we can provide truly compassionate care for our patients. So we as a society, we should strive together to make this healthcare system where we can provide our patients and treat them with dignity, respect, and understanding. So when you get into med school, it's very exciting. So you learn all the science of everything. You have all these lectures, and you get laser focused on the pathology and the physiology. And I can remember for me, I was eager. I'm like, oh, I'm going to learn about all of these diseases, and I'm going to learn how to treat them, and I'm going to learn how to manage them. But then as you go along, you realize, I'm not just treating this faceless disease. I'm actually caring for people. And in caring those, for those people, the heart of that is the compassion that comes with it. And it's through that compassion that we can um, combat this stigma that affects our patients so much. So I'm gonna take a minute, I'm gonna tell you a powerful story. And unfortunately, this story doesn't sound um, unfamiliar from what you've heard this afternoon. And I'd like for you to think of it, this is from my point of view, okay? So from what feels like eons ago, before I started medical school, I worked in the daytime, I taught chemistry lab at a private college, and then at night I would work as a medical scribe in a very busy emergency room, okay? And there is this one interaction with this one patient that sticks out in my memory, and it's not because she had some severe disease, it's because of the way that she was treated. And this was a woman, she was in her mid-20s, and when you looked on the computer to see what she was there for, she was having pain. And she rated her pain as a 10 out of 10, and she cited that she was in a sickle cell crisis. So the doctor and I got together, I got my notebook, we went into the room, just like we had done for hundreds of patients before her. And when we got in there, the nurse was there setting things up, and the doctor started the interview. And here's this woman. She's not writhing in pain. She's not yelling out. But she's sitting very still. 
and she's saying, I need something to help me with this pain. And you couldn't see it, but you could hear it in her voice, and you could hear the pain, and you could hear she just wanted someone to help her. And we finished the interview and we left the room, and I'm thinking, we're going to help this patient, and I'm going to give my part to bringing this patient comfort. But I was taken aback by what I saw next. The nurse said, she's probably just here for a prescription. And the doctor minimized the severity of her pain. And he said, oh, she's a frequent flyer. She's been here before. And there were even comments that were bandied about, about she's used marijuana in the past, and if she just stopped, then she'd be perfectly fine. And there was this disconnect that I saw between the suffering and the way that she was treated. And it stuck with me. And this wasn't just clinical Ill ignorance about this disease, this was stigma. The pain wasn't taken seriously because of the stereotypes that surround people that have a chronic illness like sickle cell. And in that moment, she wasn't seen as a person in pain. She was reduced to a stereotype and her experience was invalidated. So that night I learned something that I carry with me and I'm hoping that those of you who are here, you take something from this session that you carry with yourself as well. Compassion in healthcare, it's more than just a treatment. It's acknowledging and validating the human experience behind the symptoms. This woman didn't need to be judged or dismissed. She needed to be heard. She needed her pain to be taken seriously. Her experience highlights how stigma, whether it's through race, socioeconomic, or an illness, how it influences providers' care. And I saw it firsthand. So now we're in medical school, and so as a medical student, how do we learn compassion? In medical school, as I said before, it's, there really is a focus on science and the excitement of learning about these diseases. But these medical students come from somewhere. They have their own life experiences. And they've seen things with their own family or through themselves and how people are treated. And that teaches them compassion. And then on the other side, when you start your clinical rotations, you see patients from all walks of life. Patients who have their experiences and their struggles and their emotional tolls. And the thing is that if medical students can take these moments and they can really listen and hear these patients, then those will be the most powerful lesson. And additionally, or maybe even more equally important, and I think that it's something that Howard University excels at, it's integrating that compassion into practice. So when you learn, you have all this knowledge that they stuff into your head in medical school, but if you can take that knowledge and you can translate it into your care, then you can have effective quality care for your patients. And then I'd like to challenge everyone to take it one step farther, not just medical students, but to engage outside a hospital, clinic, classroom, your office, whatever it is, and go to the community and be and do outreach or volunteer, because in those experiences, it will deepen your compassion for other people. And you can see these diseases not just as a condition, you'll see that it's a part of someone's life, that it deserves your attention, your empathy, your care. Stigma isn't just a medical issue. This is a societal issue. And we all should work together to dismantle it. So I'm not an expert. They didn't ask me here because I know a lot about these things. They just asked me for my experiences when I see. So this is what I'm saying today, and this is my commitment for myself. The lessons that I learn in compassion, they extend beyond the classroom, they extend beyond the rotations. They come from the stories that I hear, the lives that I touch. I'm going to recognize each patient for more than their disease. Stigma has no place in the care that I will provide. I'm going to challenge myself to break down those biases that I subconsciously have and that undermine my patient's dignity. This is not a lesson to be checked off on a list. It's not a class that I can take and take the test and I'm done. This is going to be a lifelong journey for me. 
I'm going to cultivate it as I continue through my journey in medical school and um, beyond in my social interactions. So as I move forward and as you move forward, I would like for us to take each person, understand their unique story, and understand that they deserve our attention, they deserve our empathy, and they deserve our compassionate care. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was just amazing. So um, I know that we're running a little bit short on time. Um, I just wanted to give members of the audience a chance to speak if they wanted to. We have a microphone. Um, are there any warriors or is there anyone else in the audience who, who had an experience or a question that they wanted to address to the panel? Okay. Uh, she's coming with the microphone. Thank you so much. This is uh, really eye opening. Thank you for being here. Uh, this happened to a friend of mine in New York City. He was riding a bicycle and he was hit from behind by a car, and he flew from the bicycle, fell on the road, and broke his femur in four places. They took him to the hospital. The doctor decided to operate him immediately, and he was operated without general anesthesia, just local anesthesia. Two weeks in the hospital, they released him to a friend's house because the guy had a, a back entrance with a ramp. He didn't go his apartment on the fifth floor to walk up. He could not walk anyway. Um, he was left there for a week, and then his pain medication ended. He was on morphine at that time. Uh, went back to the emergency room, called me from there. He was sitting there for hours already, waiting for the same hospital he was operated, uh, waiting for hours already, and they didn't give him anything. I went over, to, I told him, cry, make a, screen, a scene. And he said, people are laughing when you start doing that. Uh, so I arrived there, uh, took me an hour to get there. I got there, waited for him another four hours before they came and finally gave him a pain medication that he needed. Uh, this is not just with individual disease. This is how people are treated. And this is totally unacceptable. So don't uh, feel like you are uh, on your corner with your disease. This is how people are treated, and we should not accept the kind of stuff at all. Uh, there is a lack of humanity, I think, that uh, happens in, in emergency rooms that is inexplicable. I understand that. You see so much trauma, so, much people, so many people suffering, that you have to create some kind of barrier for your own health, your own protection. But that becomes like a, a shell that uh, doesn't allow you to understand what people are going through or accepting that. Or, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how to deal with that. I really don't. But I think we need to recognize it. Thank you. So, so just to make sure that I understood the story, so the story was your nephew, was it? Friend. Your friend um, had an ins a bicycle accident that brought him to the emergency room where he needed to have pain medication. Okay. 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 So, so what you're trying to do is just, right, just create the understanding that this is a over, you know, overreaching problem within emergency rooms and not just specific to sickle cell disease. Okay. All right. Well, well thank you. Thank you for that um, information. Um, why don't you go ahead and stand up and talk loud? Um, okay. So um, I work in healthcare with uh, health insurance. Um, and um, 
I didn't have much knowledge about sickle cell before working in um, health insurance because I, no one in my family, friends, or anyone, you know, had it. And one of the things we learned, or I learned, in trainings was that many of the doctors were fascinated by the disease, just not the patients that, um, you know, if, who are, um, I guess, who have sickle cell. So that was the thing. They were interested in the, in the blood disorder and the process, you know, that, the, the history of it, but just not the patients. Um, but I was also lucky in the sense that I've worked with a couple of young people who were, I guess, lucky enough to have a bone marrow transplant which I didn't even know was a thing until working in healthcare, and one of them is cured. Like, he has not had any um, sickle cell crisis in years since, and it's been about three years since he had his bone marrow transplant. But it was just an interesting in how even my younger members were treated over the older members who go to the hospital for sickle cell crisis, because of course, if it's a baby, they're treated a little bit better, and then that, 20-year-olds, 22-year-olds, um, they looked like they were, it, they were, you know, like, oh, they're drug-seeking, that kind of thing, how they were treated. So that, you know, it was just very interesting in my journey as a social worker and working with patients with sickle cell and learning about the disease as I'm working with them. And so it's just very, thank you all for, you know, your work you do and sharing your stories. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here today. I'm a medical student. And I'm Why don't you stand up? Hi. <laughs> I'm a medical student, and I'm lucky enough to go to Howard, where we actually have professors who come in and teach us about sickle cell. We learn about, like my peers said, the biology, the pathology of what's going on. But today was the first time I actually experienced it firsthand from a patient. So the three warriors that spoke today, I just wanted to say thank you for your powerful story. And I wanted to ask, is there anything else that you would recommend we uh, do it early on in our, in our career that we like teach ourselves something that more that we can do early on So we don't recreate these stories when we start practicing Did you did you guys hear the question? different types of warriors. Stoic patient, you know, very dramatic, hysterical, all those things because they have different perspectives that makes the whole picture. We're not all the same, we don't operate the same, we don't carry ourselves the same, and in order for you to understand the disease, you need to spend as much time getting the knowledge behind it and talk to different patients. We all kind of have our own different stories, but we share a similar experience with pain. Pain is just something that we all experience. And I also think too, talk to your friends who don't have sickle cell, right? Because there are so many people who have the disability who looks quote unquote nor normal and you don't even know. So empathy is the thing and a lot of times the connection is just having the conversation first and foremost. That's my answer. Charles? So what you're doing, you're showing up, you're trying to learn. You're seeking understanding. So if you could keep doing that and everything Sherelle said, yes. So I think we have time. I, I see there can, there were people. Yeah. We have one more question. Okay. So I didn't know that. Okay. Hi, good afternoon. I want to thank you all for sharing your stories. But I do have a question for the medical students. You talked about um, how you would carry yourself when you got into your practice. I was just wondering, in the emergency room setting, how do you plan to break through the bureaucracy at the hospital as far as prescribing opioids or strong medications needed to treat the pain? Because that's also a stigma and a barrier. Mm -hmm. So you have compassion for your patient, but you may be in a situation where you just can't prescribe the medication. Absolutely. So then what? I agree, yeah, because of the way that it's set up, that you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. And I think that that's where it's important for us as a community that we need to make changes. And then slowly we can get people to understand. I think that one of the biggest things is that 
people don't really understand what sickle cell is and they don't really understand the pain. And I think the more conversations that we have like this and the more that people hear it, then the more movement forward we can make for setting it in place so that I can give the care so that I won't be limited in that way when I continue on into my career. Can I build on that? May, may I also add just something? I know I'm not a medical student, but we're at Howard University, historical black colleges, and I think that that needs to be identified as a factor as to why you're getting that type of care. Historically black colleges focuses on African Americans, so I do think to HBCUs play a huge role in continuing that conversation and having those things, but it's still the minority in the majority. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah, you're right, Dr. Long. Yeah, I want to build off of what you were both saying in that we can also utilize the systems and the policies within systems to rewrite the narrative. So in our own hospital system, we created a standard of care and an algorithm for every patient that comes to the emergency room such that when they come in and they say that they are here for pain, for sickle cell, a system or something happens on the back end in our electronic health record that triages them so they don't have to spend four hours in the emergency room that's consistent with the guidelines that our National um, Alliance of uh, Sickle Cell Centers has set. This is the standard. They must be seen within X amount of time. So when they aren't seen, then our quality improvement teams, or we get dinged, the emergency room gets dinged on not following the protocol and not following the standard of care, because if you don't have a standard of care, then you can do what you want. So we use the system to create the standard so that we, have, we force people to change. So, so thank you, everybody. I know that Dr. Rana sort of wants to put the last summary piece, you yeah. wanted to say something, and then um, I know that the next session is about to start. Uh, I, I would try to be very brief, but I think some things are very critical to just kind of bring it up. Number one, there are no perfect patients. Number two, there are no perfect healthcare system. There's no perfect emergency room. There are so many players there. There are no perfect primary care, and there are no perfect, there are not, not enough specialty sickle cell doctors around the country, and probably there never would be. I don't see people in the pipeline going into sickle cell care. They don't want to because of having to handle uh, chronic pain. They just don't know how to. They haven't been trained to. So in, in, in that situation, and there aren't going to be this kind of conversation, and not enough people are listening, not enough people have time to come and, and, and listen. It's, it's not going to help too much. I think what is most important is that people with sickle cell disease become perfect and knowledgeable and have toolboxes with them in their mind. What would you do? I remember one of my patient's mother screaming at me on phone. I'm at Fairfax Hospital. My child has been sitting out two hours hollering and nobody has paid attention to it. I said, you know, this is what, you, did you talk to this? Did this? She said, I tried. Nobody's listening. I said, you pick up the phone and, and call the medical system. I'm calling Joint Commission right now. My child has been in pain. And you know, 15 minutes later, she said, Dr. Rana, that worked like magic. They heard Joint Commission. And you know, everybody's scrambling and medical director, and they were bringing me food and whatnot. But again, you know, people, it, that shouldn't go to that extreme. People should have idea of, in any given system, you know, what is the hierarchy? How do I, you know, cut this BS? Uh, whether it's policy or whatever else, it's crap. It, it, it's made up system. They are made by imperfect human beings, and there's no, per or our policy is to give one milligram of dilaudid. You know, somebody who was taking four milligram dilaudid at home, now you're giving them one milligram, what's it going to do? So it makes absolutely no sense. You have to. So people have to become knowledgeable. They, they have to have, but within that second thing, do your best to establish a medical home. Some people, some physician, it could be a nurse practitioner, it could be a medical assistant, you know, who trusts you completely, with whom you have developed a trusting system, a trusting relationship over a long period of time, who would work for you and would give you a plan. You know, I may need to go to emergency. I need a plan of care to take to them, to show them, look, this is 
my plan of care agreed by me and my primary care physician. Third thing, become knowledgeable about sickle cell disease and keep up. So that's where you know, warriors need to be. Everybody needs to become a perfect advocate for themselves and knowledge comes first. And they should be ahead of everybody else in gaining that knowledge and teaching their physicians because most physicians may see two patients, three patients, four, you know, they don't see enough patient or they don't see any patient. And so you need to be educating them about sickle cell disease that look, this is what is the latest. Doc, can I discuss with you? Can I give you something I just read? And in the nicest way, you know, educate them. Lastly, you know, be forgiving because this is emergency room, there are 20 players. And, you know, if, if I'm, it's me, 10 people may be perfect, five people may be, you know, somewhere in between, and one person is jerk that I ran into, and my whole opinion of that emergency room would be through the lens of that jerk. So, be, you know, I, th I think we, ne we need to be forgiving to ourselves, but we also need to be forgiving to systems, other systems, because there are none, no perfect one. And we, just like we have a story, we had 50 things happen to us, those people had 50 things happen. Give them an excuse, give them a break. Be patient, you know, and never lose patience. But have a toolbox. If I don't pain, get pain medication 15 minutes, you know, I have, I need to talk to this, you know. And you say, I have no disrespect, I need to talk to your supervisor. I need to talk to, this is very important for me, my child, has, is in pain, and, 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 and we need to have those toolbox. So I think biggest thing is that ultimately it falls, with sickle cell disease being a rare disease, I think it falls on the patient to have full knowledge to the best of their ability, both about physiology of pain and pharmacology of pain, and their own pharmacology in way of what works for them and what doesn't, and, and have it attested by a trusting primary care physician or specialty physician or any healthcare system. This is my plan of care. This is what works for me. And for physicians, I think for medical students, it is so, so critical. We all fall into that hole. Oh, I, I, I need to treat every patient like I want to be treated. No, 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 that's wrong. You want to treat every patient like they want to be treated. I think there's a huge difference in that. And, and we've been trained, you know, we immediately go into our own biases, our own belief systems, and that trap makes us fall, you know, because we, we lose it. Because we are not listening to patients anymore. We are listening to our biases. So we need to develop this constant ability to learn from the patient, overcome our biases, reflect, look, I messed up. I look, I, I was a jerk there. You know, I, 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 my body language wasn't right, and I saw, I, and I think that's cultural humility, that I am on a journey. I am never competent. I'm never culturally competent for every patient. Every patient has to teach me something about themselves, how to treat them. And, but for that, patient has to take some initiative too. Patient need to have their things, story written up, I'm going to bring up this, these, these, these issues with me. And this doesn't just apply for sickle cell disease. I think it applies for all illnesses. But for physician, we as human beings, we need to give space for people to talk. We need to give space for us to be able to learn and to become expert on that person, or expert on Larissa, expert on Charles, you know, because until somebody tells me, I know nothing about them. Sickle cell means nothing. I have had sickle cell patients who have no pain. I have sickle cell patients who have 60 crises in two years. So I, and I don't know two pains are the same, but no two pa patients have the same pharmacology. We did studies on morphine. You know, there were 10 patients. We did how their body handled morphine. And there was like three times difference between one patient to the next how their body handled morphine. So some excreted it all, or got rid of it all in one hour. In some, it was enough for four hours. So until, but all I needed was to, to I don't need to do those studies. How's your pain now? How are you doing with it? You see, 
that, that, that thing is so important. Functionality, you know, are you able to function? Or being able to articulate, talk, it's seven, but I am able to be, to function with that kind of pain. I think I said enough, right? <laughs> you glad I'm shut up. <laughs> So I wanted to thank all of the panelists. I know that we're running a little bit behind. Um, I know that some of you traveled quite a distance to come. So we thank you, um, and we thank the warriors and the people in the audience who, who felt free enough to tell their story. So thank you for that. Um, we have Temi, one of our research assistants, uh, and he's helping with the uh, surveys. So if you wouldn't mind filling out the surveys and giving them back to Temi, um, and there's a QR code code up there. I know that um, we're running tight on time and we have the next session that is going to begin very soon. So thank you very much everybody for coming. Uh, what's the next? What's up next? Uh, yeah, it's, it's in this room. So, huh? What's the next one?